series. We're right in the middle of a series looking at 1 Peter. And I want to make an announcement, uh, first of all, for those who are listening online or watching or getting our archives. Uh, we have uh, several hundred different points of contact right now. We don't know how big these groups are. Some of them might just be a, a family or an individual. Or it could be a Bible study. Uh, but we're going to be changing our approach. Uh, we're getting a lot of requests for send me the questions, send me the questions. So a lot of emails are coming in. And I think the easiest way to do it from this day forward is just to always post these questions in a Facebook group. And that way they'll always be there and anyone can subscribe. So I'm going to go ahead and use our Facebook group that's listed on Facebook. Um, and I think there's about 3,600 members and so any of those members can then take the questions and form a group in their homes. And so it's a really neat way to connect everyone in an easy way. So look up the Facebook group under my name on Facebook, and then we will post that from this day forward. Instead of sending out individual emails, you'll just be able to log on, and it'll be there every single week. And I'm talking about the discussion questions for the First Peter series, and for every series from now on, I mean, this is pretty cool. If you didn't understand what Chip was saying, I mean, Chip is saying that, uh, you know, basically we decided to offer some questions and now people are jumping on that opportunity and then they end up watching the message and then ha holding a discussion group in their home in Alabama or Alaska or California or Virginia or wherever they are. So it's pretty neat opportunity there. Um, so uh, let's jump right in now to where we're at. I mean, look at this, uh, look at this, rewind a little bit and get back to the first chapter of 1 Peter here. And remember where we've come from. Uh, first of all, we've seen in chapter 1 that we've had this, uh, this heart of ours ripped out, a heart surgery. Uh, we've had an exchange at the core of our being and we've been born again to this new hope. Also, we've seen that, whoa, that debate that Christians are constantly having about once saved, always saved, can you lose your salvation, can you flub it up, can you be a Christian but then get no inheritance, you know, am I going to lose out on all my reward, am I going to be, be in heaven and all uh, frustrated and angry and upset, and of course, Revelation says there's no tears, no sorrow, and, and we've seen from 1 Peter that even this inheritance that we have is imperishable. And that means that it won't die. And we saw that it was protected by God's power, as if God's got a grip on it and it's reserved in heaven for us, not on earth where we can mess it up. So it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? I mean, you're saved by grace. Wouldn't you think that your inheritance is also held by God's grace and that all of the Christian life is really about God gifting us? this grace. And so then he says, well, therefore, because of all this, be holy in all of your behavior. And I don't know if you remember, but we challenged the idea that we as people are being progressively sanctified. Now, we as people are heaven ready. If you were to die in this moment, you, uh, you meet that Mack truck on the, on the road, and then you meet your maker, you are heaven ready. You are sanctified. You are set apart. This is why Hebrews and Corinthians say that we were justified, we were washed, we were cleansed, we were justified, and we were sanctified. Sanctified is not some uh, far-off idea. It just means that we are preserved for God's use. You know, I sanctified these shoes this morning when I put them on. I put them on my feet instead of my ears, and I walked it to, over here and, and up on stage, and I've been sanctifying these shoes ever since. I've been using them for the purpose for which they were designed. So you and me, we have been bought. We are holy, which is the same word as sanctified. But of course, Peter has said, now check out your behavior. Is your behavior set apart? Is your behavior designed being used for what it's designed for? Then, in review, I mean, we have been to the end of chapter 1, and he said some pretty awesome things. He said, uh, number one, God wanted you. God wanted you. He, he chased after you. He pursued you. And he bought you. And God doesn't buy bad stuff. In other words, he's made you likable. 
And he's made you lovable. And so the whole point is then we get to live loved. And it goes on to say our faith is in God, our hope is in God. We've been born of imperishable seed. That means nobody's going to yank this salvation away from you. You can't possibly drop the ball and ruin it. Um, your life in Christ is imperishable. It'll never die. Also, it said earlier, it will never fade away. Uh, and so it can't get a little bit worse each and every day that we live and try to flub it up. We really would flub it up, wouldn't we? You give it to us, you leave it on earth where we hold it and protect it, and it'll be ruined, it'll be spoiled. But of course, Peter talks about it saying that it'll never be spoiled. Therefore, conduct yourselves with respect for God. So you see, it's like, a, it's like we've got this foundation that we've built, and then on top of it are the behavior verses. So if you've been at Ecclesia any amount of time, uh, we're saying, hey, you know, we think that in general, sometimes we Christians get it wrong. We are talking about behavior, 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 behavior with no foundation under it. And you read Romans, you read Galatians, you read 1 Peter, and what you find is they are always outlining the foundation first and then telling you in response, therefore, conduct yourselves with respect for God. So if I, you know, go from church to church to church and speaking opportunities and just tell people to stop sinning, you got to stop sinning and you got to start living for God. And I, and I preach behavior on the left and behavior on the right. And I just preach behavior reform. Then I've missed it. We don't need re reformation in our behavior. We need transformation in our spirit first and foremost. We need to know what it means to be born again. And so... Uh, you see this trend with the apostles, and it's not coincidence, it's not random. They're telling you who you are, and then they're saying, wake up and be yourself. Now, chapter 2, last week, we saw our identity was this. Hey, man, you are not a dirty, rotten sinner groveling in the corner, hoping that God will like you. You, my friend, are a royal, holy priest. Now, for me, you know, for you probably too, the idea of priest, I mean, that is, that's a guy dressed in solid black, and he's got the little white collar there, and he's got maybe a robe on, and he's doing some ceremonial stuff. Priest, that's, that's a formal word. That's a serious word. That guy, now he's really set apart for God. And we talked about how all of that is really a facade, that there's nothing in a robe, there's nothing in a collar, there's nothing in clothing, and there's nothing in geography. You know, people will set themselves apart for God by going to a commune. And they'll put a wall around themselves, and they'll say, we're setting ourselves apart from the world. So they set themselves apart with geography. Or they set themselves apart with wardrobe. And what we're seeing in 1 Peter is that we're set apart because we were bought with blood. Blood is what sets us apart. The blood of Jesus Christ is what sanctifies us. And it doesn't matter whether we're wearing a, a priestly robe or a bathrobe. We're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so he says here, you're part of God's household together with the saints. You're invited to the table. Yes, you. You've got a seat at the table just like everybody else. And those who believe in him won't be disappointed because the gospel rocks. I mean, the gospel is just full of powerful truth that will never disappoint. And I've said it, you know, if your Christianity is killing you, if your Christianity is beating you up, then it's not Christianity. It's deception. It might have an ounce of Christianity in it, but then it's got all this stuff to kill it and to kill the joy. Jesus said the truth will set us free. And so this is why he says you're not going to be disappointed, and that's for real. Therefore, keep your behavior excellent. Again, the foundation is built, and then there's an application. Therefore, choose. Let your speech be seasoned with grace. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. 
put on love, put on Christ. These are the application passages that come on the heels of, hey man, you're holy, you're righteous, you're seated right next to God. This thing is real, your identity has changed, therefore, wake up and act like it. Because if you act any other way, you'll never be fulfilled. You know that little... You know, that little gulp sound and then that little tension in your throat when you've done something wrong. You know, that little tug at your heart when you've done something wrong. I mean, you're inviting a war inside of you when you walk after the flesh. The spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. The, the flesh's goal is that we not do what we really please. What we really please is now weird what we really please is strange in comparison to the world. We are peculiar, we are aliens, we are strangers, and God has rigged this thing through a nature change. And so now what we want is to have excellent behavior inspired by Christ. And when it's not excellent behavior inspired by Christ, we sense that tug of war inside, don't we? And that's a good thing. It's a good sign. If there's conflict, it means that someone has come to reside in me that does not agree with the world. All right, so here we are, and we're finishing up chapter 2, and we'll delve into chapter 3 a little bit. But we're going to talk about government, we're going to talk about rules and regulations, you know, and, and, and our response to them. Verse 13, Peter begins, he says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. Now, this is a tough passage. I mean, to me, living in the United States of America, a, um, a, a government and a, a nation that has prided itself on we call the shots, the people call the shots, and we would be very tempted if not uh, excited, to overthrow any government that would ever disagree with us as a majority, and yet this is precisely what they lived in. I mean, they disagreed with the government on many counts. You know, there was a form of slavery going on that was government-sanctioned, government-approved, and they're living in the midst of that. And so uh, these Christians are struggling with, man, I know who I am now. I mean, I am heavenly. One day, I'm going to be one of the rulers. During the millennium, I am going to rule, and I'm going to make judgment calls based on the world. And so, uh, I know who I am. And I'm not some dirty, rotten sinner groveling over there in the corner. I'm a royal, holy priest, and I've got freedom in Christ. And then, there's this government. And this government is now going to impose its authority on a heavenly man like me. And so you see, and it's good for us to see, the lens through which early Christians are viewing governments, world governments. And so what he says here is he says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake. I don't know of anyone that has ever come to salvation ever come to understand the gospel and believe in Jesus Christ to the point of being born again because they were rebelled against, because they were argued with, because they were disobeyed by some Christian who said, I know better than you. And so there's something peculiar here. It's like we've got the heavenly agenda and the earthly agenda. And so what he's basically saying is, if you got a choice here, save yourself some pain, go with the heavenly agenda. Now you look at the life of Jesus Christ. How much of the political landscape did Jesus change? You look at the Apostle Paul. How much of the political landscape did the Apostle Paul change? You know, he was imprisoned wrongly, and he wrote a lot of his letters from prison. You know, Jesus uh, said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. He, you know, he, he could have come in and, and used his power to overcome Roman authority or Jewish authority and change things to be exactly the way they should be, should be. And if we don't watch it, we think our hope is in changing human government. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. We are blessed to live in the United States where we get to vote. We get to vote our conscience. We get to vote our hearts, and everybody gets a vote. And so you vote, 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 vote. But you know that there's no, no real lasting hope in government. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him. Gosh, this just, this is not comfortable. Governors, well, maybe the governor of Texas, all right. I'll give you that one. But what about, what about governors? What about presidents? What about senators? What about political figures that we totally disagree with and yet they were put into office? This is not saying that they are right about every opinion they hold. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that God uses them to punish evildoers. And so they're in a role of punishing evildoers. And that's where we come in and respect their position. It says also the praise of those who do right. It goes on to say, this is God's will that by doing right, and I underline that because I want you to see that the point here is this general sense of you're not going to gain any respect for doing wrong. You might hate paying your taxes, but I promise you that if you don't pay your taxes, at some point it's going to catch up with you and you can be in prison talking about your opinion concerning taxes and saying that you're a Christian and that you would love for others to come to the Lord and you're sitting there in prison because of tax evasion. And the whole point is, what did you accomplish? You didn't do right. Now, if you, if you suffer for doing right, we'll see in a minute, that's a whole different thing. People can respect you if you suffer for doing right. But if you suffer for doing wrong, there's not going to be much that comes from that. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. So now, uh, you know what I think is, is ironic about this is that we'll read a verse like this and, and, and a lot of us Christians, I mean, you know, it would take us a good long while to figure out what's he even talking about, free men. Free men, what does that mean? There's a, there's a spiritual freedom underlying this verse. That there is nothing that can shake your salvation. There is nothing that can break your salvation. There is nothing that can disrupt your salvation. There is nothing that can rob your inheritance. There is nothing... Because you're free in Christ. Now, you could abuse that all day long. You could use it as a cover-up for evil. You could say, as they were saying in Corinth, well, I'm free in Christ, free in Christ. Guess I might as well do my hair like a prostitute and just show my freedom. I'm free in Christ, free in Christ. Guess I might as well get to church early and eat up all the food they were going to use to celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection. I'm free in Christ, I guess I'll interrupt the church service and tell what I think and create chaos. They were using their freedom and abusing it. And so in the midst of the backdrop of freedom, Peter has a bit of advice for us. He's saying, you do, man, I am not going to lie to you. You've got freedom here, freedom in Christ, but don't use it as a cover-up for evil. Instead, use it as bond slaves of God and notice that this is a choice. God doesn't make you a slave. Now, let me, let me look at this word bond slave for a minute. Because, you know, there's other places in the Bible that talk about us being a slave. And, in fact, I have a friend who I recently I just met on a trip. And uh, he got so mad, so frustrated with a pastor for saying that we were slaves of Christ. That after the church service, he found that pastor, walked right up to him, and told him what he thought of that sermon. First of all, that took a lot of guts, right? Because these days, it's like we're just supposed to keel over and take whatever comes our way and never question it. But 
the pastor then began to reason with them and say, yes, we are sons. I mean, Galatians says we are sons. We're not slaves. We're sons. We're not slaves. This is not slavery like we might think of it with the Civil War, you know, and slavery in the United States as our backdrop here. What this is talking about is being harnessed or connected. We're no longer a slave to sin, but we're a slave to Christ. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? No longer connected, harnessed, controlled by sin, but we are now slaves to righteousness, the Bible even says. You know what that means? It means you've got a new propensity. You know what propensity means? A force behind you, imposed upon you, Im impelling you, propelling you toward righteousness. And you can't get away from it. Yeah, you can sort of do the wander thing over here, the wander thing over here, but there's something powerful that is propelling you toward righteousness no matter what. He who began a good work in you is propelling you on to completion. And in the meantime, we might walk up to the flesh, walk up to the flesh, pick this up, toy with it a little while, discard it, pick this up, give it a chance, ah, it's empty too. But nevertheless, we're being propelled and that's what you sense in your heart if you know Jesus Christ, right? That's why you're weird. You're not running with the world. That's why you're here this morning. We're all here to figure out how can I run with the propensity instead of getting duped with these silly distractions. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. I've never had anything good come from mistreating people. And I'll tell you, I've mistreated a lot of people. I mean, I've been rude to people. I've blown up at people. I've overreacted at people. I've never had anything good come from that stuff. And so this is a time saver. I mean, it's a time saver, and it's a fruit saver. <laughs> it's a life saver. Fruit-flavored life saver. You see what I'm saying? The other stuff will get you nowhere. So it's not a you better, you have to. It's a, hey, we already know you've blown it 17,000 times doing the other thing where you don't honor people, you don't respect them, you disrespect them, you diss them, you mistreat them, you judge them, you make judgment calls about them, you gossip about them, you slander them. I mean, and where has it ever, in those 17,000 times, where has it ever gotten you? So all I'm going to do is just present you with this other option, <laughs> you know? And again, it's not going to shake your salvation or break your salvation. You've got the foundation, but here's the way to live that's going to be a time saver and a life saver. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. I had an African-American man who uh, is now part of our Facebook group, and he posted um, you know, a passage, I believe it was this passage, and maybe one or two other passages that were similar, where it talks about slaves or servants. And he was upset. I mean, he was like, the Bible is promoting slavery. How can you believe in the Bible when the Bible is promoting slavery? And, you know, so I read the passage and I interacted with him a little bit, and by the end of it, he, he, he did feel differently. But what I want us to see here, and what I shared with him is, I mean, this is not Peter or God advocating government policy. Again, Jesus didn't come to change politics. Paul didn't come to change politics, but they did come to show us how to experience the life of Christ in the midst of our current circumstances on planet Earth. Big difference. Change your circumstances? Not most of the time. Live within the midst of your circumstances? Whole different ballgame. And so, what Peter is saying here is, you know, you've got a whole society that is bought into this servanthood and possibly slavery of some kinds. They bought into it. Are you going to change all of society? Likely not. 
So here's some advice for daily living that will keep you from, well, just unnecessary stress. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience toward God a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So do we respect the axe murderer who's sitting in prison? Do we seek after his counsel? Absolutely not. He suffered for doing wrong. But a lot of these letters were written while a man sat in prison. Why did he suffer? He suffered for doing right. And so we respect those who suffer for doing right, but we don't respect those who suffer merely for doing the wrong thing. So pick your battles. Isn't that what he's saying? Pick your battles. Make sure if you're going to get in trouble and suffer, it's for the right reasons. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Now, uh, you know, this is not merely that I look back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and I try to do what Jesus did. You know, if you tried to do what Jesus did, you could end up with a real martyr complex. And I kind of, I'm not going to say I live fully like this, but I, I kind of flirted with that idea. It was like, I, you know, as a young, as a, as a teenager, young adult, um, I, I kind of look back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even the early church, and it's almost like I wanted to get in trouble for preaching the gospel. So I would get on uh, subway trains, and I would go from car to car to car, and I would preach the gospel for um, one minute and 17 seconds, and then the next car, one minute and 17 seconds, and I had it down, and I would have an altar call, so to speak, at the end, and then I'd get to the next car and the next car, and I did this sort of thing in Washington and Greece and Italy and all over the place. And, and I, I was trying to be an early church person. I was trying to follow in those steps. And see, that's very, it's, it's, it's very religious for us to look at the external and try to follow those things. If they did it, I'll do it. If they did it, I'll do it. And see, now what the gospel is telling us is you don't have to succumb to that sort of thing. We're led internally by Christ. And it's not about doing what someone historically did exactly as they did it. It's about being inspired and motivated from within. And this is why at this church we're constantly emphasizing Christ in you. We use the term followers of Christ a lot in the world today. People say, I follow Christ. Are you a follower of Christ? And that kind of implies that Jesus is out there, up in front somewhere, and we're following him, trying to imitate him. You know, monkey see, monkey do, that sort of thing. And we're looking and trying to do what would Jesus do. And we have the bracelets and the necklaces, and it's imitation. And Paul even mentions imitating Christ. But, but this following and imitating doesn't have to do with just looking back at a historical teacher and doing what he did. It's actually, it's actually about being inspired internally, and what we imitate is the attitude of dependency. We imitate the attitude of dependency that Jesus had on the Father. And so uh, that's, that's very different. Jesus Christ gave up his rights. He depended on the Father to come through in some way, and he was obedient even unto death, and that's an attitude. We may never suffer on a cross, probably won't, but there's an attitude there, and that's what we're called to follow and imitate. And here he goes into it. He committed no sin, never told a lie, nothing wrong with his speech, absolutely clean, and yet, you know, while he was being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And isn't this kind of the, the attitude? Uh, you wake up, and your boss is mistreating you, and you say, man, I can't, can't control my boss. I, I've tried to, I've prayed for my boss. God changed my boss. Please change him or her. Make him respect me better. Anybody ever prayed stuff like this? Uh, you know, make my job more fun. I hate my job. Make my job better. 
and, and, and circumstances seldom change. I mean, sometimes we get a miracle, right? But circumstances seldom change. And so look, the flesh wants to say, change the pain level here. It's a seven. I'd like it to be a four. God, I'm praying that you'll make it a four. And, and, and yet sometimes it remains a seven. And so you say, God, what is going on? The, I'm a righteous man. These are righteous prayers. I really mean them. I even put in Jesus' name at the end. <laughs> right? I dialed the right number. I made the right call. And yet my circumstances aren't changing. And so what he's talking about here is maybe it's not about getting different circumstances. Maybe it's about releasing these circumstances to God and trusting him and saying, I don't know where this is going. Um, and he, let's go on and finish up. He says, and he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. We might die to sin. Uh, this isn't a might or a maybe. Uh, what this verse is really saying is, hey, uh, you know, I walked into Starbucks so that I might buy a coffee. Okay? When did I do that? Well, let's say last Saturday, I walked into Starbucks so that I might buy a coffee. Did I go into Starbucks? Yes. Did I buy a coffee? Yes. So the might is not really a maybe, who knows. That's not what this is. It's saying that Jesus did something on the cross so that we might die to sin, and we did, and live to righteousness, and we do. So what does it mean to die to sin? I mean, that's just such a fancy Bible word that I'm afraid we'll miss it. What it's saying is like the, the, the shallow existence that we had before, where you, you become friends with people and then you end up talking about you know, how good the food was at the restaurant and then how great the beverages have been lately and then what you did on the weekend when you went to the water park and then you have a nice talk about how your family's doing and that's it. Shallow, base level, earthy. There's nothing below that. And then... In Jesus Christ, we all of a sudden get awakened to something deeper and richer and more meaningful. It's not just surface level. It's rich and deep and excellent, and it's life in Christ. And we, get alive, we become alive to that. And then what's even weirder is at the core of our being, we're awakened, and then he begins to uh, inspire and animate our family life and our food life and our work life. And, and life with our kids. And so the, the, the depths of life in Christ then become the inspiration for all that stuff that we used to call surface. And now it's even part of our life in Christ. Every little thing is part of our life in Christ. Everything is spiritual. Now, lastly, I want to finish up with this thought. It says, for by his wounds you were healed. Um, I shouldn't even have to address this, I feel like, but um, it's out there. And the idea is that, oh, Jesus has um, healed you physically. You're already healed. And by his wounds, you were healed. And you just don't even recognize it. So you just need to name it and claim it. You're already healed. Physical healing is guaranteed. And I just want to point out that that's not the context of this. This is talking about a spiritual healing. Spiritual healing from sin. Miracles happen. God heals people. We got somebody here in our church. He stood up in the middle of his hospital room, got out of bed, saw Jesus. Jesus healed him, healed of cancer. Hadn't come back. So, I mean, we believe in healing. We believe that God does miracles. But they're called miracles for a reason. Because they're rare and special displays of God's power. They are not a right. And so, you know, it's like uh, Jesus getting whipped in the back. And the slashes are there and the blood's pouring out. And then somebody comes up to him and says, why don't you just claim healing in that? Why, why, why deal with an open wound? I mean, you should just claim this. And, you know, he's given up his right 
to cush circumstances, easy living, and a pain-free existence. He's given up his right. And then we Christians on this side of the cross, all of a sudden we say, we've got a right to be healed. You know, I've got, the, I've got a condition uh, called hemochromatosis. And hemochromatosis is, is uh, basically your body latches onto iron. And uh, so your iron level over week one, week two, three, week seven, week nine, it builds up. And I start feeling symptoms from this. Uh, some of the symptoms are uh, uh, low energy, joint pain, uh, all kinds of symptoms. It can attack your organs over time. The strictest kind of this, people live a shorter life. And so, you know, it, it, I didn't find out really what I had or what was going on until about two years ago. And I lived with some symptoms that were increasing since, I, I remember them since about age 18. And so, you know, I could, I could go, God, you let me live with this for 22 years of my adult life. What is going on? What kind of God are you? That is not fair. And then I could say, well, but wait a minute. I mean, first of all, thank you that I exist. <laughs> I don't have a right to a perfect existence. I don't have a right to cush circumstances and easy living. I give up my right to that. And I, I'm just thankful that at age 38 that I, that I found out what's going on and there's some way to treat it, some way to deal with it, but yet the symptoms are getting worse. They don't get better for anybody. They either maintain or get worse. And so I'm invited to this place where I question God, wrestle with God, demand my rights, uh, say, what's going on here? Come on, I'm your kid. Uh, come on, I deserve better. Or I see this thing that Paul and Peter are talking about, give up your rights. Give up your rights to cush circumstances and easy living. Loads of people have it way worse physically than I do. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be an expert on how to deal with stuff. I'm just saying that, man, there's no other way. There simply is no other attitude that works. And so, uh, you know, Jesus, obedient, even unto death, serves as this example. And then he lives in us, and he inspires us, and he gives us these new thoughts that we might otherwise never have. Well, let's stop here for today, and let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for your... Your love for us, uh, we thank you for just the fact that no matter what's going on externally, that there is something big going on internally. That the Bible even says we're wasting away. That physically, we're wasting away, we're all dying. We don't take this humanity, this physicality with us. And so... Everybody in this room deals with stuff. We deal with planet Earth stuff, and it hurts. And Father, I just, I just think we all want to say thank you. Number one, thank you for life. Number two, thank you for life in Christ. Thank you for, for all that you've done for us. That we don't have a right to cush circumstances, but you, you have given us the right to be called children of God. And that is what we are. Wow. We thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You guys stand with us, please.
government operates just eats you up. Maybe you've wanted to change your physical circumstances, your health. You wish things could be different. You know, I don't know whether things will ever change for you, for me, in this area, that area, the other area. I mean, the, the promise is not that things will change this side of heaven. The promise is that we get to know the Lord in the midst of it. I've got a friend who he shared a story. He was with his good friend at the side of his hospital bed. The man was dying of cancer. He was in the final stages. He looked up at my friend. And he said, you know what? He said, cancer is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And my friend said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I just, I just had so much invested in all that I was doing and so much invested and all that I, that I had physically around me, visibly, that I, I wasn't focusing, I wasn't even thinking of setting my mind on getting to know the Lord. And cancer, it just gave me an opportunity to shift and refocus and fix my eyes on Jesus. And you just hear that, and you just say, did he really say that? And did he really mean it? And you know, the bottom line is, there's nothing here for us outside of Jesus. There's stuff that will last a decade or a few, but there's nothing here for us outside of Jesus Christ. So why not wake up every day and enjoy Him now? He won't disappoint. Have a great day.